Hello, in today's lesson, we're going to have a look at Tybalt again, and we're going to look at Tybalt in Act 2, Scene 4. Now, we don't actually... ...conversation between Mercutio and Benvolio, but as Tybalt is in so little of the play, it's important that in your essay, we include sort of every time he's mentioned. So we're quickly just going to revise some key vocabulary again you can use in your essay. So last week we looked at Tibble as a truculent character. Can you remember what truculent means? And can you please answer the following question? How are both Tybalt and Mercutio truculent characters? Remember Mercutio is Romeo's best friend um, who is not a Montague or a Capulet. He is a relative of the prince, but he chooses to align himself very much with Romeo and seems to very much dislike Tybalt. So if the cover teacher can just pause the video and give you guys a minute to just answer that question. So our new word is antagonize, although I'm sure many of you may have heard it before. If you antagonize someone, you are deliberately causing someone to become hostile or angry through your words or your actions or your behavior. So if you antagonize someone, you're really trying to, to wind them up, essentially. So again, if you can just pause the video, give students a chance to copy that down. Now, um, at the start of the play in Act 1, uh, Scene 1, we see Tybalt try to antagonize Benvolio in that opening dialogue of theirs. So how does Tybalt antagonize Benvolio in the opening scene of the play? Think about uh, the way he insults him. And then if you want to aim higher, try and remind yourselves what is an antagonist? It links to the word antagonize. We looked at it in our last lesson. And would you describe Tybalt or Mercutio as the antagonists of the play? And are they typical antagonists? So I'm just gonna ask the cover teacher to pause the video again so you can answer those two questions as best you can and then I'll run through some of the answers. So if you're truculent, then you are very aggressive and you're very defiant. And this is a word that can be used to describe Tybalt at the start of the play and throughout, in fact, um, in Act 1, Scene 5 that we looked at last week when he refuses to back down, even though um, Lord Capulet's ordering him to just leave Romeo alone. That's not something Tybalt's prepared to do. Um, he's also very truculent in the fact that he refuses to stop the servants fighting at the start of the play. Um, Mercutio himself is a very truculent character as well. He's almost just as bad as Tybalt, really. He's always um, trying to sort of wind people up and antagonise them. And he's always looking for an excuse for a fight as well. So it's no surprise that when we meet Tybalt and Mercutio, um, when they meet in Act 3, Scene 1, that we're going to be looking at next lesson, it's no surprise that they end up having this big fight. So Tybalt antagonises Benvolio then because he calls him a coward. He um, mocks him the fact that he's got his sword drawn among these heartless hinds, these sort of cowardly peasants, if you like. And he basically turns around to Benvolio and says, look upon thy death. You know, I will kill you. He turns around and says that he hates, you know, Benvolio and his entire family and aligns them with demons from hell. So he couldn't really be more antagonistic towards him. So we looked at this idea last lesson that Tybalt is an, one of the antagonists of this play. An antagonist is someone that causes obstacles for the main characters, in this case, Romeo and Juliet. So Tybalt is definitely an antagonist. Uh, Mercutio, you could argue, is an antagonist in the sense that he heightens the conflict of the play, particularly in Act 3, Scene 1, the fight scene. Um, so you could argue that actually they are both antagonists here. So our knowledge goal today is to analyse how Tybalt is presented through Mercutio's dialogue in Act 2, Scene 4. Like I said, we don't actually see Tybalt in the scene. We instead hear about him through mm -hmm. Mercutio's dialogue with Benvolio. So if the cover teacher could pause the lesson, please, and give you a chance to get that knowledge goal written down. So after the lesson, you will have analysed how Shakespeare uses language to present, to present Tybalt through what Mercutio says about him and have considered the purpose of Act 2, Scene 4, and why Shakespeare develops our impression of Tybalt in this way. So we're really, again, going to think about the purpose 
of this scene and Tybalt's presentation. And we're going to be therefore planning the next section of your essay today. So just a little bit of a fill in then on what happens. Last week, we looked at one scene five, which is when Tybalt gets told off by Capulet because Tybalt wants to fight Romeo for uh, crashing their party and refuses to let it drop. We then see in the rest of Act 1, Scene 5, Romeo and Juliet sort of meet and fall in love. But then by the end of the scene, they've realised they've fallen in love with their enemy. So Act 2, Scene 1, we have Romeo, Mercutio and Benvolio who have all left the Capulet party. But Romeo changes his mind and leaps back over the orchard wall to try and find Juliet. So he runs away from his friends. Mercutio, thinking Romeo has gone to find Rosaline, tries to antagonise Romeo to come back by sort of cracking sexual jokes about Rosaline. So he's trying to deliberately wind Romeo up to get Romeo to sort of come back. But Mercutio eventually gives up and both him and Benvolio go home. So then Act 2, Scene 2, the famous balcony scene. We have Romeo sneaks back into the Capulet grounds and notices a light on at a window. This light uh, reminds him of Juliet and how she is his son. And he has this big romantic uh, soliloquy about her. Juliet herself then appears at the window. She does her famous, famous Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo speech, where she basically declares her love for him. Remember, Juliet's got no idea Romeo is in fact lurking in the bushes like some weirdo. He then leaps out of the bushes and declares his love for her. Um, you know, there's a lot of backwards and forwards and flirting and declaring their love for one another. And eventually, by the end of this scene, uh, they decide they're going to get married or try to get married the next day. Romeo tells Juliet to send a messenger to him the next morning to find out if he's managed to basically convince this priest to marry him. So that's how that scene ends. Act two, scene three, Romeo then goes straight to Friar Lawrence. And remember, Friar Lawrence is a bit like a father figure to Romeo. He's obviously someone Romeo confides in. And he begs Friar Lawrence to marry him and Juliet that same day. At first, Friar Lawrence is very reluctant to do this because Romeo was just in love with Rosaline the day before. He says one of my favourite lines of the play, which, you know, maybe young men's love lies not in their hearts, but in their eyes. Although he probably doesn't mean eyes. Um, eventually he agrees because he thinks it will bring the two families together and stop the ancient grudge. So he does eventually agree sort of against his better judgment, really, because he thinks it's going to bring the two families together. Unfortunately for Fry Lawrence, that decision comes back to bite him in the backside, really, and it goes a bit horribly wrong. So then we see Act 2, Scene 4, the scene we're going to be looking at today. So basically we have Benvolio and Mercutio enter. This is the morning after the Capulet party. And Mercutio says, where the devil should this Romeo be? Came he not home tonight? So they're basically wondering, you know, where Romeo is because he didn't go home last night. Benvolio says, not to his father's. I spoke with his man. So Romeo never came home, basically. Romeo and uh, Mercutio says, ah, oh, that same pale, hard-hearted wench, that Rosaline, torments him so that he will sure run mad. So they're assuming Romeo's sort of off crying about Rosaline, basically, again, as he's been mostly doing recently. Benvolio then says, Tybalt, the kinsman, relative of old Capulet, hath sent a letter to his father's house. Now, the reason why I've highlighted this in red is because this is a really important plot point. As a result of Romeo sneaking into the Capulet party, Tybalt vowed, remember, to get his revenge because Capulet wouldn't let him fight Romeo then and there. So he sent a letter to Romeo's father's house. And Mercutio here says, a challenge on my life. Now, this letter is really important because it is a formal invitation to a duel. Now, in those days, if you had an issue with someone, you, you could write them a letter, basically challenging them to a fight. Um, the winner of this fight would essentially um, be the sort of honourable one, if you like. Um, this was perfectly legal, as long as you followed the right sort of procedures, which Tybalt's done by sending this letter to his father's house. Now, duels could be to first blood, meaning the first person to sort of cause an injury to the other, or it could be to death. We don't know which one this formal letter 
sort of said, but we can assume it is to the death because Tybalt just seems that angry about it. Um, so this idea of a challenge is really, really important. So Benvolio is pretty assured here. He says Romeo will answer it, meaning, you know, Romeo will answer the letter. Romeo will um, fight in this duel. Because if Romeo had decided not to fight, he's going to cause dishonour to himself and his family. He's going to appear to be a coward. So they just automatically assume that um, Romeo will answer this challenge, basically will fight Tybalt. Mercutio, because remember Mercutio is never serious, says any man that may write, that can write, may answer a letter. So he's sort of deliberately downplaying, I suppose, the seriousness of the situation that their best friend could fight this duel to the death. Benvolio says, nay, he will answer the letter's master how he dares being dead. So Benvolio is saying, no, he will fight. You know, Tybalt's challenging him, daring him to this fight. Of course, Romeo's going to respond. And Mercutio is again joking, as he always does, about Romeo here. Alas, poor Romeo, he is already dead, stabbed with a white wench's black eye, shot through the ear with a love song, on the very pin of his heart cleft, with the blind bow boy's butt shaft. And is he a man to encounter Tybalt? Now, Mercutio is mocking Romeo here because Romeo is very much a lover, not a fighter in his recent behaviour. You know, Romeo will be more than capable of fighting. He would have had the same sort of formal dueling training as any other, you know, rich per rich man his age. But he doesn't exactly come across as someone that likes fighting very much, at least not currently. You know, this whole sitting in the woods, crying, being lovesick. Um, so Mercutio is sort of joking, really, and saying, oh, well, Romeo's, he might as well die already. Because unless he sorts himself out and gets over this sort of lovesick, overly emotional nonsense, um, is he, you know, man enough to fight Tybalt? Now, Mercutio is not really being very serious here. He doesn't seem to be genuinely worried about Romeo. It's just an excuse to sort of take the mickey out of people, really. But again, it's quite interesting that there's this idea of, of Tybalt that they're discussing, that Tybalt is someone who has quite a sort of fearsome reputation in amongst them. So Bovenio says, why? What is Tybalt? And then this next speech is really important, actually. And this is where you'll probably get your main evidence from today, because this is where Mercutio is giving his opinion about Tybalt, Tybalt's fighting style, and, you know, Tybalt's reputation amongst the, the local community. So he says, more than Prince of Cats, I can tell you. Now, this phrase, Prince of Cats, is a nickname that we hear a couple of times in the play about Tybalt. So Tybalt gets his Prince of Cats nickname because he shares his name with a cat character from a famous fable of the time, a story. A fable is a story with a moral that involves animals. Think Aesop's fables that some of you may have read as children. So the, there is a cat character called Tybalt who is in this famous fable, okay? And this character is also aggressive, likes fighting, quick-tempered, just like, you know, the Tybalt in the play. So that's where this Prince of Cats nickname comes from. Um, it's mocking, essentially. You know, Mercutio is mocking Tybalt. However, we've also got this association with cats, which could suggest Tybalt's graceful and agile like a cat. And again, potentially like a cat has nine lives that he'd be difficult to difficult to kill. But Mercutio is definitely using Prince of Cats as a way of mocking and insulting Tybalt here, rather than the fact that he actually respects him. Oh, he is the courageous captain of compliments. So we have this sort of alliterative phrase here with courageous captain of compliments. He's, again, continuing to mock Tybalt. Compliments is um, obviously being pleasant towards, towards someone um, and calling him the courageous captain of compliments. He's building up this impression here that actually Tybalt's almost a little bit effeminate. He's a little bit womanly. Um, 
you know, he's more likely to sort of stop, stop someone in the street and pay them a compliment than he is to necessarily frighten them. He fights as you sing prick song, keeps time, distance and proportion, rests me his minimum rest, one, two and the third in your bosom. Now, prick song is sheet music, essentially, um, you know, the sort of Nota formal notation of, of music. So what we have here is this sort of metaphor for the formal style of dueling, of sword fighting or fencing, um, sort of used um, with sheet music and music notation. So this keeps time, time, distance and proportion. It's obviously to do with the sort of time signature or the the structure of, of a song. And then minim is, is again a, a note with two beats. So what Mercutio is essentially doing here is he's presenting Tybalt not as a sort of manly, down and dirty, aggressive fighter. He's presenting him as somebody who, yes, is a very skilled duelist, knows all the moves, knows all of the formalities and the regulations, but actually it's more like a singer, more like a dancer. And he's presenting those things as being quite effeminate, quite feminine, rather than something that anyone should be afraid of. So when he says the very butcher of a silk button, again, is this mocking phrase, this idea, you know, Tibble is somebody who is presented um, as taking, you know, care over how he looks, this idea that he cares about his reputation, he cares about you know, his form when he's fighting. And these are all things that Makusho doesn't take very seriously and doesn't think make you very manly. A duelist, a duelist, a gentleman of the first house, of the first and second cause, um, the immortal Posado, the Punta Reverso, the Hay. Now, these are all fencing moves, okay? So he's essentially mocking Tibble all the way through this speech, giving the impression that he cares so much about appearances and the way he looks and the way he comes across that he's not actually a proper manly fighter and therefore nobody should be frightened of Tybalt or in fact really show him any respect. Benvoli has like the what? So Makushu is going on a bit as usual. And then Makusha says, the pox of such antic lisping, affecting fantasticos. So actually, he starts getting a little bit irate here, Makusha. He starts, you know, really insulting all these people who really care about their appearance, who really care about their fighting form, who care about, you know, following the sort of polite rules of society. He actually finds that really quite annoying. These new tuners of accents by Yezu, a very good blade, a very tall man, a very good whore. Why is not why is not this a lamentable thing, grandsire, that we should be thus afflicted with these strange flies, these fashion mongers, these pardon me's, who stand so much on the new form that they cannot ease on the old bench? Oh, their bones, their bones. So again, this is just Makusha going on, really. You know, these people that care so much about being polite in society and following the rules and following, following sort of the formal ways things should be done. Um, and he definitely is presenting Tibble as being one of those types of people. And what he's really explaining here is about why he is not personally intimidated by Tibble, despite the fact that he's got a reputation for being a good fighter. Um, and it may seem a bit strange to, for me to say, well, I'd like you to write about this section in your essay, but it is actually really important because Tybalt is being very deliberately presented in a certain way here by Shakespeare. So let's then think overall, how is Tybalt presented in this scene? Obviously, we only hear about Mercutio's view of Tybalt here and the reputation that he has. However, Tybalt is in so little of the play that it's a good idea to reference this scene, even if it's just one quotation. So I'd like you to think about what we have just gone through. And I'd like you to pick one or two quotations from this scene that develop your impression of Tybalt. I'd like you to explode them in your exercise books and consider how the language develops your impression of Tybalt's character. 
So again, the cover teacher can pause this, give you guys about 10 minutes to do this. If you need to flick back through um, to earlier on in the lesson or in this video lesson to actually get the extract back up on the screen, then obviously that's something you can ask your teacher to do. So if you pause the video now for about 10 minutes, think about the quotations you're going to choose to use and explode them in your books. So now you've picked your quotations, we need to think about Shakespeare's intentions and why he chooses to present Tybalt in this way, in this specific scene. So Shakespeare's purpose in this scene is to use Mercutio and Tybalt to build up the dramatic tension in preparation for Act 3, Scene 1. So that's his real intention here, this building up of um, this sort of dramatic tension just before in a few scenes time we have this big fight scene by showing the audience the animosity that just means the sort of hatred between Mercutio and Tybalt and the fact that Tybalt has a reputation for being an excellent fighter even though Mercutio thinks it makes him less manly Shakespeare is ensuring that the tension is high during Mercutio and Tybalt's confrontation at the start of act three scene one we also have an important plot point in this scene that Tybalt has challenged Romeo to this formal duel, which, as I mentioned in the last lesson, leads to essentially the deaths of Romeo and Juliet at the end of the play. So what I'd like you to do is, again, pause the video for a few minutes, look back at your exploded quotations and add in some of these notes. You know, what is the purpose to the presentation of Tybalt in your quotation? Think about this heightening of the dramatic tension, this build up to this structural sort of narrative turning point of the play in Act 3, Scene 1, when this play goes from a comedy to a tragedy after the deaths of Mercutio and Tybalt. So you can pause the video now and just add those to your exploded quotations. Um, so now you've done that. Um, obviously, it's hard to know exactly how much time you'll have left in the lesson. Um, if, if you do have the time, what I'd like you to do is spend that time picking one of your quotations that you're going to choose to write about on this scene and have a go at writing a practice mini PE paragraph. Really try and analyse how the words give you that impression and specifically you know, what the purpose of the scene is and why Shakespeare has chosen to include it and present Tibble in that way. As always, if you'd like me to have a look at any of your notes or any of your exploded quotations, do please feel free to take a little photo with your phone. I'm sure the teacher won't mind. And you can email it to me directly for some feedback or if you have any questions. OK, see you next time.